trail and ultra runners what is going on what's happening welcome to another episode of the coop cast as always i am your humble host coach jason coop i'm excited everybody is here with me today this week we have another nutrition focused podcast it seems that that is the theme which is all very appropriate right now given people are ramping up their training for this year's upcoming races y'all will remember last week we spoke with meredith terranova about how to practically implement your racing and your training nutrition and this week we switch gears and we talk a little bit more about the science behind it this week's episode guest is christopher rush out of monash university and let me say right out of the get-go before i go any further monash has been absolutely crushing it in the research game over the course of the last nine or 12 months it seems like every week when i open up my inbox and i look at the pubmed searches that automatically get dropped into there there is something of tremendous value from monash so fist bumps and kudos all the way around to that group and it just so happens that a lot of their research has an ultra marathon slant and that is the subject of this week's podcast. Chris was the lead author on a brand new paper that examined the feeding tolerance, glucose availability, and oxidation rates of ultra runners in response to prolonged exercise. And one of the things I appreciated about this paper is that it challenged our previously conceived notions and our previous guidelines for how much carbohydrate athletes can actually take when they are out on these long runs. And I do think that if you listen a little bit to this podcast and some of our previous guests that we have had about this subject, one of the things that rings true is that we do need to keep a cap on how much we are eating and drinking out there on the course. And it might fly in the face of some of the standard recommendations that are floating out there. I will let the conversation speak for itself. I hope everybody listening out there gets something out of this conversation. I certainly did as a coach, and it's something that I'm going to start to implement with my athletes as well. So with that as a backdrop, I'm going to get right out of the way. Here's my conversation with Chris Roush out of Monash University. You guys have been killing it over there at Monash University. Like, what is in the water there where you guys keep cranking out all this research? I've got, I was telling a friend of mine earlier today, I have three different PubMed uh, searches set up up for different like keywords and things like that, that I get auto dumped into to, into my inbox. You guys take up like 60% of whatever I'm getting emailed on. So I don't know what, I don't know what to attribute that to. <laughs> um, yes, we, uh, yeah, we have a lot of studies on and um, yeah, it's really just exploded. Like since our first, uh, first gut study that, uh, that we did um, a number of years ago, um, it's just kept growing and growing and it just always seems to keep moving forward. Like we always um, answer some questions, but then a whole heap of you know, new questions emerge and then we pursue those. Um, one, one uh, yeah, which, which, which brings, brings a real problem for us uh, with recruitment. <laughs> you just run out of subjects. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, when, when you think about it, uh, there's only so many, you uh, people that, that are willing to run three hours on a treadmill in, you know, in a lab and have all this stuff done to them. <laughs> so, um, you know, yeah, that, that is, uh, that is a challenge, especially, yeah, especially at the moment, with, you know, coming out of the whole COVID thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've been in academia for long enough and I've been coaching for long enough to kind of realize that especially in an ultra marathon perspective, or even if we use Ironman as a little bit of a surrogate to that, uh, mm-hmm. since it's more commonly studied, the number of people that are willing to do something like that has has actually been on the rise. I mean, we you, we can actually recruit people to run three or four hours on a treadmill or be on a bike for five or six hours where seems like 10 years ago that was like you know just you they look at you like you're an alien or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um well not not only that jason we we I, I mean i even get um paying clients to do this so um so out, out of our out of our research um we, we've actually developed um an exercise clinic so uh because so many of our um our participants from, from research, you know, we, we gave them feedback from, from our findings and they, they, they went on and, and won races, <laughs> you know, or in the very least had big improvements 
Um, and we thought, actually, you know, we should be selling this service. So mm. alongside the research, we've also got the sports clinic where we, um, we use our research protocols. Um, and um, yeah, and people pay a lot of money for it. Yeah, and I I have an athlete that has actually utilized it uh, as 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 well, and it's one of those things where I've just come to know just through this podcast and you guys' research um, that I can trust what's going on there. So I have no hesitation sending an athlete over there for whatever protocol it is, whether it's a heat protocol or nutrition protocol or whatever, because I've seen all the research and yes, I realize that it's going to be, you know, that the protocols and things like that are going to be a little bit different in a commercial, you know, commercial application, so to speak. But I'm hard, I'm, I'm, this is completely outside of what we we're going to talk about. That's totally fine. I'm really heartened to see that because a lot of times there's this missing gap between academia and reality, you know, in terms of what athletes are actually going to use. And I, I like, I, I actually like seeing this, this change where a lot of, uh, uh, universities and, 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 and research institutions are starting to also bring in this more, I'm going to say the word commercial, but people are going to get mad at me because it makes it sound bad or something like that. But this more kind of commercial side to it where they're bringing in the public for like paid services, essentially. Yeah, yeah, look, absolutely. And I mean, uh, yeah, if, if you don't like that, and I, I guess I have to qualify that when you, when you say commercial, um, like, you know, and I say people pay a lot of money for it. As far as the uni is concerned, it, it really is just cost recovery. You know, yeah, we, we do it yeah. as a service, yeah. but you know, it it is it's expensive to run a university lab. Um, you know, it's expensive to run the bloods and yeah. you know, and and the time and everything and insurance and all the stuff that happens in the background. So it really just cost recovery from us. But as far as the exercise clinic is concerned, the the other thing I'd like to say, sort of building on what you said there, is. Um, one thing, um, or one direction a lot of research is taking is that it is more real world. And, and, mm. and the word, you know, the word they like to use is translational. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all very well saying, oh, that's, that's interesting. But how does that apply in the real world? Yeah, I've gotten, not that I'm getting sick of it, but I'm going to use that phrasing anyway. I'm kind of getting sick of the mechanistic studies. Like I just, cause yeah. I've just seen them so much. I'm like, okay, I understand this biochemical pathway. I understand that this is going to happen when you're metabolizing that and show me the real world application. And we we're starting to see it a lot in training right now is in like training interventions, right? So the whole polarized mm -hmm. versus pyramidal training. I had somebody on my podcast yeah. recently where we talked about that. To that one recently. Yeah. It's yeah. Fantastic. Where, yeah. And he and he's that's that's the way that uh, Luca is actually taking his research as well, where there are these big mm. training intervention designs, which are complicated to get off the ground for a whole host of reasons. But seeing what the actual practical outcomes are of, of hey, this person's going to train like this, they're going to do high volume, this person's going to do low volume, and we're going to see which one wins, essentially, I think that is the stuff that is ultimately cool at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and when, when, you know, when I read studies, yeah, you know, saying we're talking about mechanistic stuff and, you know, a researcher studying some signaling protein or something. And at the end of the day, like, yeah, interesting. And, you know, it gives us insight, but I, I don't know how they do it, to be honest. But... Yeah. <laughs> we, we can go on and on and on. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Needless to say, man, you guys are killing it. So well, seriously, you, so. you guys, no, you guys are absolutely killing it. The volume of stuff that you're producing as well as the quality. I've been, I've been really impressed. So I don't know whether you're just getting on a lucky streak in COVID or whether <laughs> something there is like changed within, within like your team or whatever, but the quality of the people that you guys have first off, first and foremost, I think is, is, is a good telltale sign. You guys have a really high quality team there, but the research that you guys are producing is, 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 has been quite remarkable. So I'm appreciative of it. I wanted to start out just with saying that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very, very, yeah, thank you very much for saying that. Um, I guess, you know, me, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just a PhD student myself. Um, and, you know, I really have to acknowledge, um, our, our dietetic and extremes physiology lead, um, Pro professor Ricardo Costa, um, you know, he, he really is the brainchild behind a lot of this. Um, but yeah, we are a fantastic team and we all, you know, work together you know, in, 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 a, in a really fantastic way. So, um, yeah. Can you broaden that up a little bit before, before we get into the paper that we're going to discuss very specifically? 
I'd like for the listeners to kind of understand the team there and what some of the like the focus points of that team are. We mentioned, you know, Al McCubbin, who's been on this podcast before, and I'll leave a link in the show notes to that. But can you just give a broad overview on some of the things that you guys are studying as a group? Yeah, absolutely. Look, our, our biggest area of interest is um, gas, uh, exercise gastroenterology. So um, basically it is um, how, how the gastrointestinal tract or, or the gut responds to the stress of exercise. Um, so we look at, uh, we, we typically look at, at um, the symptomology that occurs under exercise stress, um, how, how ambient conditions change that and affect it. Um, we look at uh, markers of damage, so uh, actual intestinal damage. Um, and um, yeah, what, what else can I say? Um, you know, and, and yeah, so we, we, you know, our, our research has uncovered pathways um, for, for these. Um, uh, so the, the, term, the term used is uh, exercise associated gastrointestinal syndrome. So you know, it's, it's, there's no one causal thing. Um, you know, we, we've identified causal pathways um, and um, there, there, there's, there's so much interest in it because we're now finding links to, um, to the clinical arena because we, we have in our, our ultra marathon runners and especially in the heat, um, all this gut stress. So um, the, the perturbations, the damage, et cetera, but it's very close. It very closely resembles what happens in a clinical state. Like if someone has um, inflammatory bowel disease or uncontrolled celiac, that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, we're really branching out into diverse areas, all related, all related to gut. Which is really neat because normally it's the other way around, right? Normally a lot of what we are informed about on the athletic side comes from the clinical side. And I always use this yeah. analogy of the Normatec boots, right? Which were previously used for diabetic patients and trying to increase circulation with people with diabetes. It all of a sudden migrated into the athletic field as a, as a way to apparently recover more quickly or better after uh, after hard workouts. So the fact that you guys are doing it in an opposite fashion is actually kind of neat. I, I can kind of summarize it like this though. You guys put athletes and endurance athletes and, and, and ultra endurance athletes in arduous situations, either via duration and or temperature and or feeding, and you see what happens to their gut. Yes, yes. Thank that, you. It, Summarize it, that much better than me. <laughs> well, <laughs> You've I can been doing like, this for, for a long time, right? <laughs> well, no. I see. Here's the. Here's the. I have. A, I have a little bit of an end since I've had an athlete that that's gone over there. The the way that she describes it to me is, I went in this room and it was really freaking hot, and they made me run hard for a long period of time and stuff food down my throat. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that's, a, that's so, a much better summary than my, my, uh, yes. My well, yours is more, yours is more clinical. Hers is more practical, right? Um, <laughs> okay. So we're the primary paper we're going to discuss, and this is one that's kind of fascinating to me on a number of different levels. Um, yeah. it's got a super long name. So the listeners are going to have to like put I'm through surprised the name. Anyone get, <laughs> yeah, I'll be surprised if anyone gets past the name. It's horrible. The, the, the title of it is like, yeah, I, I'm giving you a lot of credit for producing good, really good research, but this title is a doozy. I will link in the show notes so nobody has to memorize it, but it's feeding tolerance, glucose availability and whole body, total carbohydrate and fat oxidation in male endurance and ultra endurance runners in response to prolonged exercise. <laughs> consuming a habitual mix macronutrient diet and carbohydrate feeding during exercise so that is an ultra marathon type of title in, of, in and of itself yeah <laughs> so just reading that. the title is an act of yeah ultra isn't it really <laughs> so let, let's try to boil this down like practically what are you practically what are you trying to what are you trying to distill out of the protocol well first let's just go over the protocol right what are you putting yeah. this what were you putting the subjects through and what data were you collecting Okay, so um, it's essentially it's essentially a collection of studies. All right, so we we we've had um, we, it was three studies, um, and uh, you know there there were some things that we saw in the data as as we were going where we're like, gee, that's that's interesting. We really need to uh, you know delve into that and and you know yeah put it out there. So um, what we're doing. Um, 
Should, so should I, yeah, sorry. Should I talk you through sort of the three the three study designs? Yeah, yeah like because you guys okay. are getting to this, as you were just alluding to, you were taking data that was previously collected and you're Correct. getting and you're determining different things from that. So you can get yes. into what the three studies we're looking at first, and then we can get into how this kind of alchemizes it second. Yeah, okay. So the first study was the original gut study we did, and that was um, getting ultra runners. So, so first they do their, um, their incremental exercise test, the VO2 max test, and that really essentially is just the, um, uh, the initial assessment for us where we can determine um, this, the running speed, their steady state running speed, and that is 60% of VO2 max. So they run for three hours. The first two hours, they're, they're running at the 60% of VO2. So, so steady state, you know, for most of them, that's um, uh, 10, 10 K an hour or six, six minute um, kilometer pace. And during that two hours, they're being fed um, with some formulated gel discs. So we actually made up these little jelly blocks or, or discs. Um, and that was 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Then for the third hour, they stop feeding and then they do a distance test. So they're going as hard as they can for that, for that final hour. Um, and, uh, so the, and then the second study, they, there was no distance test. It was just three hours of steady state running, but they're feeding at uh, one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram body mass. Okay, so relative relative provisions rather than just a blanket 90 grams. Um, and they, uh, yeah, they're, they're also feeding for the first two hours in that. Um, and that they got a lactulose challenge in the third, but I won't go in, in, in the third hour, but I won't go into that now, unless you want me to. <laughs> no, I, I think the carbohydrate and, feeding is the thing that most people correct, are going to readily yes, identify uh, with. So, absolutely. Yeah. And then the, um, the third one was uh, three hours steady state running um, and feeding for 90 grams per hour using um, a, a beverage. Um, and they were, they were feeding for the whole, the, the whole three hours. Now, when, when they're doing this, we're, uh, we're measuring their, um, their total body carbon fat oxidation. And that's, that's using a met cart. So breath by breath analysis, we put the mask on them periodically through the study um, and, and capture their, their O2 and CO2 data. We are measuring, uh, we're measuring malabsorption of carbohydrate administered and that's done through hydrogen breath testing. Um, and I can say a few words about that too, if you Yeah, if you go like. ahead, because a lot of people will yeah. be curious why, why that is somehow uh, indicate of, or why that somehow indicates carbohydrate malabsorption okay so when we ingest some carbohydrate there are this, look this can happen with all carbohydrate but particularly with fermentable carbs okay and uh the prime one in this case being fructose or, or fructose however you want to pronounce it that is that is by definition poorly absorbed in the small intestine so you know your, your intestine takes 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 it up but some of it passes through undigested into the large bowel where it ferments. When it ferments, your, your gut bacteria release hydrogen and methane in the process. But the, the gas we're really interested in is, is hydrogen in this case. That gas then diffuses through the, through the gut lumen and into the blood, and then we excrete it out of the lungs. So when we, do, when we measure breath bags, we're measuring parts per million of hydrogen produced. And that's, yeah coming coming out via that mechanism so that that tells us um tells us in you know there's a little bit of an indirect way as you can tell because you know it's got that pathway to go through but um it is a very good indication of in, in a controlled lab situation for carbohydrate malabsorption does, does that all make sense that's per yeah that's perfect because Excellent. a yeah. lot of times when we just go out and spout out oh we're measuring this because it's poof it's an indicator of that if you very if you very simplistically describe as you did why that is then then the case then people will go ahead and make the link okay it's just undigested fructose right Und undigested carbohydrate that we're now then detecting yeah. in the breath correct correct yes <laughs> so you've got these three groups you have these three studies that are yep. going through a three-hour exercise test 
at a moderate intensity, 60% of Correct. your two max. Yeah, yeah. They're T- getting typical fed. for ultra marathon runners. Yeah. Yeah. Which very typical training pace for, for, mm-hmm. uh, for ultra marathon runners. And I would say typical race pace for some, for some ultra marathons. So very practical application. You're feeding them carbohydrates at a, at, at a high rate, 90 mm-hmm. or 70 was the other. Uh, yeah. 76 was yeah. the, yeah, that was the main of the one gram per kilogram body mass. Okay, perfect. So those are high rates yeah. of, of, of carbohydrate ingestion, not the yeah. highest we've seen, but certainly I would consider it on the high I'd side. Still call it aggressive. Yes. Aggressive. Yeah. That's a good way. To, that's good. Especially in an ultra situation. It's hard to keep that up over the course of hours and hours and hours. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and um, we're also looking at their blood glucose response. So yeah, every, every 30 minutes, we get them to stop for a few seconds, do a finger prick, check their blood glucose. Uh, what else are we doing? Oh yeah. And, and the other thing, um, that we're, that we're doing periodically. So every either 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I think we we found from the first study, 10 minutes was too much, (laughs) um, is, uh, checking the, um, what we, we call the symptomology. So we've got a questionnaire with a big range of questions where they rate their symptoms. So you've got your upper GI symptoms, um, belching, stomach bloating, urge to regurgitate. And so and worst case scenario, vomiting. Um, we don't normally have to ask that one funnily enough. Um, <laughs> if you've got the bucket in your hand, then yeah, it's a 10 They know, 10. they know. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, you've got your, your lower GI symptoms, um, low, low down bloating, um, uh, urge to, def- to defecate. And, and yeah, if they actually need to stop to actually go to the toilet. Um, and they rate all these things. So five and above, we call significant. You're thinking more about that symptom than you are about the exercise at that point. 10 out of 10, obviously so severe, you need to stop. Um, and we also assess tolerance. So tolerance to food and tolerance to drink. Um, and this is a really important one. Um, so yeah, obviously if, um, yeah, and, uh, and, and the question is actually, um, I can eat and, you know, oh, I could drink. So it's about force feeding, essentially, mm-hmm. you know, whether that be food, um, you know, carbohydrate or water. And we, we assess that periodically through, throughout. So l- let's kind of dive into what the significant findings were. And I'll t- let you take the lead on kind of what category of the things that you just mentioned you think are the most significant to initially talk about and what some of those practical applications are because i found i found a lot of different nuggets as i was kind of as i was moving through this and but i want to hear from you like when you guys are uh, you're essentially uncovering information that was in previous studies that wasn't really analyzed or thought about in the same way yeah. I look at I look I remember seeing the original studies coming out and having something in the back of my mind going oh wow I wonder about this I wonder about that and this study kind of uncovers a lot of that so I want you to take take us through like as the research as the researcher the person who's who's analyzing this data what things were sticking out to you as the significant findings from looking at these three previous uh, pieces of research and analyzing it in a little bit of a different way. Okay. Okay. You're going to have to guide me through this a bit too, Jason, because I'm going to go off track and lose <laughs> my path. Fine. So. That's totally fine. <laughs> and and what, what, what I did is sort of, you know, in preparation for this interview, I sort of wrote down the key findings from, from results because there's, there's so much you know, data in there. Yeah, yeah. But the way you've just posed that question makes me think, hmm, should I even like talk you through that first? I guess, it, yeah. Yeah. Um, for a lot of people, this 90 grams an hour, if, if they're running, is, is a real problem. Yeah. All right. That's <laughs> that's that 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 was that was something that was really quite quite obvious to us in 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 the very first gut study. Um and we, you know, and we're and because we're taking these multiple measures, like you know, across all these these um different things that that all relate, they all come back to your ability to keep running at at your you know your your race pace. Um, they, they, they all give this sort of quite consistent picture that for so many people, 90 grams an hour is just not appropriate. 
let's put a pin in that really quick and kind of go back to yeah. the history of that, right? Because yes, I yes. remember I remember when these recommendations were initially formulated and shout out to to somebody that you and I know uh, quite well, Asker Jukendrup, who pioneered a lot mm. of this research. Yeah. And it was done and it was done th largely through the mechanism of transport. So you have glucose yes. transporters and you have fructose transporters. It turns out when you combine those two, uh, those two carbohydrates in, in a specific ratio, you can transport up to 50% more of them. So going from the yeah. old recommendation yeah. of 60 grams per hour up to 90 grams mm -hmm. per hour. And I remember that being that recommendation being wholeheartedly adopted by the entirety of the endurance community almost instantaneously. And it was kind of a weird phenomenon because it was initially based off of this transporter theory that had been researched, right? But yeah. it was, as we were alluding to earlier, largely a, like a, I hate to, to, de to denigrate the, some of the research that was done at the time, but a lot of it was mechanistic in nature, as we were yes. alluding to earlier. When we go into the practical realm, and this is my realm, I work with athletes on a day-to-day -day basis, I was getting the same feedback that you are now finding in the lab, that it's just simply not tolerable either after a certain duration or yes. underneath certain conditions, heat, extreme stress, yeah. hours after hours after hours, the arduous conditions that you set your lab up, that you've kind of set your lab up to be. And now we're just, we're kind of coming full, full circle back to these original recommendations saying, okay, we need to make sure that they're couched in the right context when we're delivering mm -hmm. this advice. Yeah. Yeah. Look, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, you know, and also the, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, the, the body, the, the size of the person doesn't matter. I mean, that, right. you know, and to say, oh, there's, 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 there was in, in that, those make like, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Like I have so much respect for, for the research that Asker did and uncovering those mechanisms. Um, but, you know, it's important to remember a lot of that work was done in um, elite male cyclists um and you know i mean our, our elite male cyclists that they, they all sort of very closely within you know a certain you know height and weight to, you know it's not they're very <laughs> not, homogenous yeah yeah very homogenous <laughs> yeah, group yeah, yeah. um whereas you know in ultra marathon you know you might you might have some some big guys that are you know 80 plus kilos if, if not more um and then you might have a, a you know a 52 kilogram female and you know feeding them the same amount it just doesn't make sense does it but also the modality makes it less tolerance as well right and just absolutely simply yes. you know jostling up and down in a running motion Correct. versus sitting on the bike is is, is absolutely and i don't th i think this was underappreciated in the early 2000s when a lot of this was pioneered the, mm -hmm. the modality seems to seems to matter a whole lot more than we had initially thought and this type of research Correct. is starting to uncover that where you know, 90 grams or even 76 grams, which, you know, should be relatively tolerable underneath some study conditions are now becoming quite intolerable underneath the conditions that you guys are asking these subjects to uh, perform under. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I... So that's the first thing. These 90 grams of carbohydrate carbohydrate an hour might be too much for some individuals, especially in an ultra marathon setting or especially in a in a running setting. And that's showing up in both the hydrogen that you're measuring in the breath and that's, in yes, the subjective feedback just... or both. Yes, correct, correct. So um in the in the hydrogen response, um we had uh 38% of participants um showing a breath hydrogen response indicative of malabsorption you know That's a so lot. yeah yeah um in terms of um yeah feeding tolerance as well so at the 90 grams for both studies so both studies you know slightly different protocols but they both showed the same thing um that that the tolerance is is really quite poor um mm. Is, is do you attribute that since it is a little I don't, I'm not going to say a deviation, but it is it is well it is it is a little bit of a deviation from what we would consider certainly a maximum tolerance. What do you either from a practical perspective or from a research perspective 
do you attribute it to the mode or do you attribute it to some other mechanism as it being different as, as compared to what no, we've you, previously seen? Yeah, Jason, you absolutely nailed it before when you said with, with the running and the, the jostling, the mechanical rubbing, all, all that definitely plays into it. You know, we, we, have, we have no doubt. Um, and, you know, and, and that, that's, that's certainly in terms of, um, of um, uh, sympt uh, symptoms. So gut symptoms, you definitely get more symptoms. Um, we do have some emerging data. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this on air, but <laughs> we know in terms of gut damage, it's a different story, but I, mm. yeah, like I say, I'm, <laughs> There's a little teaser for you. Is that what's some coming more, out? That's, that's the next the thing pipeline. that's going to land in my inbox, you know, in, in a few months from now. <laughs> it's not yeah, going yeah, to bring yeah, you absolutely. back on to talk about that one. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, look, definitely the mode of running um, that, you know, and, and I mean, because I, I mean, I also, as, as, a, uh, as a sports dietitian, I work with a lot of triathletes, you know, and very often, you know, they're smashing it on the bike, no problems getting it in. And then all of a sudden they get up and they, they start running and things just start to turn pear shaped. Yeah. And, and we think, you know, when, when you think about it this way, when, when someone feels, uh, you know, really like, uh, you know, crook in the guts for, for want of a better term, that, that, you know, you double over, you're hunched over, right? Yeah. Very much like you're hunched over on the bike. <laughs> exactly. And, and then when you get up, it's like, Oh, geez, that's, that's just hit me. Whereas with, with your ultra marathon runners, they're, they're always in that position and they've got that constant, um, you know, jolting and, and jarring. Well, and we've seen this and you've seen this very particularly strategy play out in triathlon where you're, you're feeding more on the bike as compared to the run to take advantage of some of the tolerability that we're now just seeing in the lab that's been used from a practical standpoint for, I can't even tell you how long, you know? So it's one of those things where the research is kind of like lagging the athlete's actual experience where they can say, listen, I can do 90 grams an hour on the bike, but on the run, I'm going to go down to 50 just because yeah. I can't tolerate it. So I'm going to take it over here and lose it over there. And it ends up coming out in the wash. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the first big one is this, we need to take, a little bit of a different look at the tolerance specifically within running and we can't universally apply some of the 90 grams per hour de facto recommendations that have been delivered over the years we have to we definitely have to scrutinize that more as the mode changes yes yeah okay yeah. so that's takeaway number one what else do you have what's the second one on your takeaway list okay uh you the, the fuel kinetics yeah <laughs> did you yeah, yeah, yeah you that's to absolutely talk, talk about that yeah this is another thing where once again i've seen this in our physiology lab all the time yeah right but to see it actually okay. kind of come out in the literature as well i'm like okay yeah i've seen this i know so, exactly so, where this is coming from yeah right okay so what 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 are you what, what what have you seen then if you don't mind me asking you jason so the biggest thing is the rate of maximal fat oxidation where in a typical research design, you're not going to see that get above like maybe 0.6 or 0.8 grams of, of fat burned per minute. But when we bring people into our lab for a commercial test, we started out talking about commercial tests. Mm. We can kind of we can kind of finish there. I see all the time we'll have fat burners of one gram a minute, 1.2 grams mm. a minute. And I have always attributed that to, and you can tell me if I'm full of BS or not at this point, I have always attributed that to they're coming into the test underneath different conditions. Some of them are coming in like perfectly fed. Some of them are not perfect. They're, these are real world, world people. It's not a study design where we can control every single aspect. Yeah, yeah. we give them recommendations to come in underneath the same conditions, but some people don't always follow that. And so to see that actually like play out in a, in a research design where we're starting to recognize that normally, normally habitually macronutrient fed, normal macronutrient type of distribution yeah. athletes are actually seeing a little bit higher of a maximal, uh, maximal rates of fat oxidation as compared to what we thought earlier. It kind of matches this commercial experience that we've seen all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah I, <laughs> that, that's actually fantastic to hear you say that, Chase. And I, I didn't, yeah, I, I probably yeah should have done my homework, but I didn't realize you 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 will also do this sort of testing in uh, yeah in, in the very lab. very standard. So just to give you a little bit of a background, because we can kind of ping off of this. So we use the United States Olympic Committee protocol. 
So three minute incremental uh, ramp test with a break between the threshold component and the VO2 max component. And I'm not going to bore the listeners with what that protocol, you know, looks yeah, like, but yeah. we're, we're testing at different intensities, I guess is what I'm saying, but yes. it's two separate tests separated by 10 minutes that tests both for the threshold component and for yeah. the VO2 max component. And we're doing full gas analysis and lactate measurements either on the bike yeah. or kind of, or on the run. But my point with that is, is when we look at, when we look at the, the metabolics of what's going on and what fuels are being oxidized, we always see things that deviate from the literature because we're getting normal people in and under normal circumstances. And in particular with the one that point that, that kind of stuck out to me uh, from your research paper was this slightly higher shift in maximal fat oxidation that yeah you don't typically see in a lot of research in a lot of research papers. I've always seen that. And we have kind of always seen that in the lab for whatever reason. So let's go through that piece right there. I don't know yeah, if that was on yeah, your list yeah. or not. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's fantastic. And um, yeah, it's actually, yeah, really nice to hear that as, yeah, as I was saying before, because, um, you know, I mean, sometimes I'm looking at the data, I'm like, you know, <laughs> trying to make sense of it, you know, I almost doubt it myself. Um, but yeah, look, and, and, and this is this was a, a big discussion point in, in the paper that um, for the ultra marathon athletes, they are regularly training at the point of stressed glycogen. This is this is what we think is is a big part of it. So um, one just just the sheer amount of time they're out running um, and and stressing their glycogen stores and then backing that up constantly. And um, the other thing is. Um, you know, from, from working as a, as a sports dietitian, it's very hard for a lot of uh, athletes, even recreational athletes, to actually meet the carbohydrate requirements of the sport. Yeah. And so you're very often going, like doing sessions depleted or even just semi-depleted. Um, and, and that's what we think is, is the reason why we see this, you know, and in, in, in these more real, real world scenarios where even if, even if they have, you know, eaten, uh, you know, a, a decent meal two hours prior, even if you're feeding carbohydrate aggressively during the running, um, we still see these high rates of fat oxidation, right? Um, so, yeah, um, exactly as you said, you know, there, there's that that mean around the, um, you know, point, point 0.6 to point, point 0.8, but we had, um, we had almost, yeah, almost half of our participants had a fat oxidation of, uh, of of one or higher grams yeah. per minute, yeah, and that's a, that's a lot of fat burn, right? Like 60, 60 grams per hour. Like I, I think of it this way, <laughs> right, right or wrong, but uh, you know, if you're running for four hours, that's that's like that's almost like a third of a tub of, of butter or margarine. <laughs> <laughs> I love that analogy right there. That's so brilliant. I never thought about it like that. That's that's great. Um, um, so so when I when you see that right, and you had the same discrepancy that I kind of had, and once again we didn't plan this out. Like we're just practitioners, and and you're in the research field, and we just kind of noticed the same thing. What do you attribute it to? To is this a training thing? You mentioned that they're it, that they constantly stress their glycogen levels. Yes. Is this something where it's just a sheer byproduct of the volume and intensity that they're training at? Look, I, I think, and and, and I, I, I guess we we as a lab, yeah, we think that it is about about the training that it's inherent mm -hmm. in if if you're doing that sort of mileage that that your your ultra marathoners do, um, this is going this will be a byproduct of it. So here, let me ping you on this since you're, since you also work with somebody, since you also work in a sports dietitian uh, perspective as well. Mm -hmm. When I hear something like that, the, the alarm bells that go off in my head are ultra marathon athletes are already good fat burners as a byproduct of their training. A lot of them, not all of them. No, a lot of them. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thank you for that caveat. Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot yes. of them are. And so when we're undertaking training interventions that are intentionally designed to upregulate this thing that we're already good at, those training interventions might be misguided for those groups of people. There are all your caveats right there. But that's how I handle it from a practitioner per, like, like perspective. And I'm wondering, is there a way that an athlete, an athlete just out there can, get a, can kind of get a fix on that? Or is that a correct way to look at it? Uh, 
Yeah, look, I, I think so. Um, yeah, if you think about people going, uh, you know, on extreme diets to try to upregulate this, um, you know, that, that, that's good and fine. But, uh, you know, first of all, yes, as you said, maybe you already are a really good fat burner. Um, and, and second of all, there, there may be other flow on effects that you're not aware of or we're not aware of, yeah. and, you know, and I can come back to that a bit later if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Does that. Is does there, that let me ask you, let me ask you this this way. Cause you mentioned some people, right? Yes. Yes. The, can you the, tease out why some people are and why some people are not? Um, I think, look, Yeah, we when when we when we did we did this research, we we captured their um their their like very very in a very crude way how much they're training, right? How many hours? Um, but we're not we're not getting the detail. We, you know, we we don't know how many years they've been training for, or you know how often they do really long sessions and and how often they back them. We don't have all that detail. So, um, you know, in our study where we've seen this massive variation, um, and I mean like. So there, there were a handful who actually really were not good fat burners you know yeah. um maybe they don't have the the years of training behind them or maybe so that there's there's that that factor something else we've observed is there are some people where we know they do the training like we, we have the, the you know the full the full backstory we know they are a really high level ultra runner and doing the, doing the k's and yet they're just inherently really good carb burners and that's what they're good at and that's what their body does. And they can perform really well doing that. Um, yeah, we, we, we do believe, yeah. So, that, you know, that we do believe there's a bit of a genetic component there. Um, and yeah, you know, and in some cases, uh, yeah, possibly even um, a, a medical element. So if someone mm. has some autoimmune disease, that's an observation we've made can't substantiate that from a research perspective but um it seems that uh well i mean we know when the body's under stress it favors carb metabolism yeah um so yeah that's that's yeah something we've seen but yeah i i, I we can other than that which is very broad as an answer yeah i don't think we can really pin that down why there is that massive variation I think we should back up just a little bit because the listeners are going to want to know, like, who are these people you're picking out competitive and elite marathoners and ultra marathoners, all who have a mixed macronutrient diet. And I think the carbohydrate percentage was 57% uh, plus or minus. Yeah, so that's right. Yes. Okay. Yes. So not a low carbohydrate diet. I would consider that a normal no. carbohydrate, carbohydrate Absolutely. diet that would be in line with the ISSN's recommendation of 60%. Uh, carbohydrate for uh, for endurance athletes, depending upon if you want to use a periodized carbohydrate approach or whatever. Mm. But it's, in, it's in the ballpark, right? It's certainly not Absolutely. ketogenic. It's certainly not. It's certainly not low carb, and yet you're still seeing this wide range of maximal fat oxidation, which is the peak of how much fat you're burning on a unit time basis. Mm -hmm. um, and we quite we don't quite know why like how to kind of like pinpoint that down. And once again, I've, I've mentioned the anecdote that we've seen this in our physiology lab where there's this great mm. spread of people that are all the way down to 0 0.4, 0 0.5, all the way to 1.2. I think I've seen some people that are like at 1.6, same setup. They're in a mixed macronutrient diet. Yeah. They come into the lab and I've always attributed it to an inconsistent pre-test nutrition right? They're coming in fasted for whatever yeah, reason. Our, it's our first thing in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There you go. So we yeah, have differences, yeah, we have yeah. differences there, but then there also might be some other individual components that you could, that you could test for as well. Let's go back to the discrepancy though, right? Cause this is another mm. thing I wanted to talk about. <laughs> you don't see differences fed or non-fed in this maximal fat oxidation rate. No, no, sorry. I have to qualify that. Um, I guess what I'm saying there is, even though they're fed with, because in all our studies, they're always fed. We, we don't do fasted. It's just not real yeah. world. Yeah. So we, we think, why, why do that if it doesn't ever apply? Um, 
so, you know, I mean, sometimes we make dietary changes in our studies, um, you know, because we want to actually like literally bring on some, some uh, gut damage. Yeah. Um, and we know how to do that through, through manipulating the, you know, the diet 24 hour or, or three day prior to the exercise protocol. Uh, but, yeah. but all, yeah, yeah. But all our, all our studies, um, yeah, they, they are fed, you know, you know they're, they're two hours postprandial, essentially. I get it. I get it. So you're and, saying and you don't still... see it because of the way the research is initially set up, where I'm, I'm looking yeah. at it from, we give them that recommendation, you know, we send out yeah. the standard lab packet and things like that. Sometimes they follow it and sometimes they come in, they haven't read a single thing. <laughs> That's just yeah. real world people coming yes. in for a test. <laughs> but anyway, um, we can kind of get back to the study. So it seems, it seems to be though, that there, there still are some individual components at play because you have this standard, you have a relatively homogenous group mm -hmm. um as well as they are do they're all doing the same nutritional intervention right they're coming into the uh they're coming into the yes. test fed and you're feeding them a standard amount yep. on a per unit time basis you're still seeing this relatively big variance in maximal fat oxidation yes and we don't yes. know what to and attribute that to no no unfortunately not you know i mean yeah, we're, <laughs> we're all just physiologically a little bit different, I guess. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, so what were some of the other big takeaways that you could mention from uh, from from analyzing all this data? Um, okay, so there's this uh, there's this other concept that is frequently cited in um, in the literature that um, uh, exogenous carbohydrate um, oxidation that that the limiting factor is gut absorption. Does, 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 do those words make any sense to anyone? Because it sounds ridiculous. To I've me. heard it a thousand times. I mean, once you do <laughs> yes, the limiting, yes, limiting you have... factor is the gut. I can sit here and I can recall. I've probably got notes from conferences I've been to behind <laughs> me that say exactly that. I've probably seen a hundred slides with that as the title over the course of my coaching career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and. Um, you know, and that that's frequently like as as you've just said, that's that's so frequently quoted, and yeah. and I would also suggest frequently misquoted or misinterpreted. Mm. Okay, because when you stop and think about it, well, yeah, what what you're eating, you know, the uptake limited by the gut. Mm, okay, you know, big deal. <laughs> well, the the uptake and the metabolism. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um. But in, in our study, we, we, we couldn't determine that. We, we didn't, it wasn't part of our methodology or, or, or even what we're really interested in. We're just, because we're doing breath by breath analysis um, and we didn't have any, any traces or anything. So we, we, can't tell, we can't tell exactly what's being metabolized when we do that analysis. We just know it's this percentage of carb, this percentage of fat. Um, so we're looking, that's, that's why we always say in, in the, in the um, in the manuscript, it's it's whole body carbohydrate oxidation or whole body fat oxidation, not coming from one specific source or another. Correct, correct. Yeah. So some of it, uh, some of it's um, coming straight out of the muscle, and some of it's coming through the gut and you know from from the blood and and, and so forth. But we we saw some uh, some strange things that seemed to sort of fly in the face of of um, of, of what the research has been saying. Right, and the research is saying. When you've got really good carbohydrate availability, um, and I think I alluded to this earlier, but when you've got really good carbohydrate availability, that the body will favor carb metabolism. Now, one thing we saw though was uh, people start off at uh, arresting blood glucose. So, you know, it might be, um, you know, 4.5 millimole per, per, per liter for, you know, for a good high level athlete with, that's really insulin sensitive maybe just around the five. And then they start the exercise and the blood glucose rises as you know, it does partly from the actual exercise stress itself because the, the liver you, kicks off um, and, and um, releases uh, glucose into the blood. And then also you're feeding. So you've, you've got glucose coming through from, from the uh, intestinal lumen. Um, now we, we saw once that rises in the first 30 minutes, the blood glucose stays quite consistently high across, across most of our trials, right? Or pretty, pretty much across all the trials. Um, and yet as even though that blood glucose is there, one, um, 
your carbohydrate oxidation, um, that starts to drop over time anyway. Even though the glucose is there in the blood, um, the, the body's not metabolizing that. So where's the barrier? You know, mm. it's already passed through the gut into the blood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the barrier is perhaps um, the, the, the muscle itself, like getting, getting that glucose then from the blood into the muscle and then, and then furthermore from the muscle being metabolized in, in the mitochondria. So, um, so that this is, uh, yeah, this is sort of some of the mechanistic insight that, that you know, that we, we think we got from, from our data. Um, whereby there can be different limit rate limiters for carbohydrate oxidation in different athletes. And is it always tapering down, meaning you start at a carbohydrate oxidation rate of, you know, what, however many grams per minute, and then it's tapering down over the course of Not one hour, two yeah. hour, three hours? Okay. It, yes, it always does. But when we analyze the data and we're looking at statistical significance, Yep. Um, for uh, it was only one of our studies where it was statistically significant that mm -hmm. that drop in carbox, as, but but in all the studies you, you see it you see it trending down like and and you, anytime you get someone in the lab and have them running for you know two hours or more you do see that um, and you know you, you would be aware of that too right Jason yeah. that you yeah. yeah you see the respiratory quotient um, yeah you see you see it drop. Which has always been an interesting phenomenon because you know the carbohydrates on board, right? You know there's yes. sufficient there's sufficient availability. You also know that the exercise intensity isn't changing because it's a steady state exercise. Correct. But yet still there is a metabolic shift over the course of time that is duration dependent from carbohydrate to fat for probably a host of very, you know, of, of, of different mechanisms to where Ooh. the body starts to favorably oxidize more fat versus carbohydrate as exercise goes along, irrespective, once again, of the availability. Yes. And this is, this is where we think, uh, or we, we think, we know, and it's also, you know, like beyond this study and, and looking at, at the, the, uh, the, the clinic stuff that we do, um, the actual caliber of the athlete we think plays a big part here. Oh, really? So I've, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and it fits in with, um, with an earlier study, which was always cited as a gut training study, even though there was no gut training protocol, but they had one group of athletes where they gave them really high carbohydrate diet during intense, like an intense training period. And, and the, the other one's not so high. And um, the increased carbohydrate oxidation rate seen in the high carb group was seen um, as, um, as, as the reason that, yeah, that they were oxidizing more carbohydrate. I hope I'm not getting too technical here. I'll bring it back. No, 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 that's good. <laughs> so what, what we see, what we see in the lab, get an Olympian on the treadmill and give them this same massive dose of carbohydrate. You know, I called mm -hmm. it aggressive before the 90 grams and they just take it up. And as soon as it's in the blood, bang, it gets sucked into the muscle and, right. you know, and oxidized. So even, so, you know, this this Olympic athlete, the he, he, the uh, you know we yeah we see the the blood glucose it, it barely got over like four and a half milli millimolars right even at ninety grams right and yeah just smashing it on the treadmill and yet these um these more recreational athletes uh, it hangs around in the blood more mm. before it gets taken up and that, and that's even when they increase the intensity. Do you think that that's more, that's a benefit of just their training because they're doing, doing yes. more high intensity training and then they have the kind of the, the biochemical capabilities of transporting, yeah. tra transporting all that glucose into the muscle? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, they're just, yeah, they're, they're, they're so well adapted at just taking up, taking up carbohydrate and burning it. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, this is cool. So you've got this piece of research, right, that challenged some of our previous notions on fueling, particularly mm -hmm. around the modality, challenged some of the notions on the proportion of carbohydrate versus fat that could be burned, especially when you're looking at it from a duration perspective. 
give us give the listeners and give myself this is just totally selfish at this point so i'll, I'll totally admit it <laughs> <laughs> the listeners will care but i'll care more what's coming down the pipeline like what questions are you trying to get answers to in the future and what do you think is like left what what do you think needs to be researched next okay uh yeah there's um oh geez there's so much coming through <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if I guess you want to take anything out afterwards, I'll more than tell more. Be more than I'll happy just, to I'll take just it vomit out everything out then, Jason, and then later I'll go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. It's all good. It's a you. You'll have. I'll tell you. I'll tell you right now. The listeners love well, this look, kind of back and forth. You'll have three weeks between. No, wait, two weeks between when we record this and when you can redact anything. So go have, have, no, no, have a field day. I don't, with I don't it. think we'll need to do that. Um, I guess. So what, what's coming through? Okay, so we're. We're, we're very interested in um, in gut microbiome. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that's something that's so heavily researched at the moment. And I mean, if you want to know my personal, my personal opinion, this is, I'm not speaking on behalf of the university and this is my personal opinion. I think so many people are getting a bit overexcited about gut microbiome. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, uh, in our lab, we're, we're actually like, sure, we look at it and we try to analyze and try to make sense of it, but it's such a complicated, yeah. Uh, ecosystem inside the gut. Um, so we're more interested in actually what's happened, the changes in the blood. Mm. Right. It's all very well saying this is, you know, yeah, X, yeah. X, Y, Z happening in the gut and, you know, short chain fatty acids and blah, blah, blah. But actually what, what's, what's actually going through into the blood and what changes is that happening? So looking more at the outcomes, that's, that's what, that's what excites me on that side. Um, yeah, look, what's, yeah, I mean, my PhD, we're, we're, you know, I'm looking at what is, what's protective to the gut. Mm. Um, but if we come back to the, uh, the, the ketogenic thing that, you know, we were talking about earlier, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, this whole trying to upregulate fat oxidation, that's all good and fine, but something that hasn't actually been really looked at very extensively is, um, is that having well, are there other health consequences that we don't know about? Um, so there are some some theoretical concerns that that we have about that, um, and we actually have data which you know once again there's, oh, there's more data that I, that I can mention but not tell you about. <laughs> but what are the theoretical ones? I mean, I think okay, there the should be liberty to, to discuss that because the research always emanates from okay, we have a thesis that this might be happening. Let's go ahead yeah. and investigate that thesis through this pro through this research design. What what do you think initially might be going on? Okay, so what what we do know is um, high fat diets are are very inflammatory, like not just on the body but also on the gut. Okay, and you know I mean we even know we, you know which which fatty acids have that effect in the gut. And something else we know is. Um, when you when you give people high fat meals, um, you increase um, you increase the amount of gut permeability that happens. So in, in layman's terms, you know they, they call it leaky gut, which yeah. you know, we've, we of course sure. don't don't use that that term, but the the the, the tight junctions in, in the in, in intestinal membrane actually open up and let more of the intestinal contents through. And that's that's just normal physiology. That's not illness or anything. Yeah, that happens. But the consequence of that is that some of the contents from inside your gut, which is supposed to be external to the body, even though it's inside the body, it's outside the body. Some of that leaks into the blood. And this, this can cause, uh, you know, your, your immune system deals with it, it mops up, but at some point that can become dangerous. Okay. So if, you, um, if you're on a ketogenic diet and then you put yourself through uh, this incredible exertional stress, like an ultra marathon runner, throw into it some horrible hot conditions where um, where the gut is under even more stress and um, and getting more actual intestinal damage. There is a potential for uh, for things to go horribly wrong, and I'm talking about um, uh, heat illness um, and and. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's not widely understood, but but heat illness actually um, is 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 believed to originate in the gut and from gut damage. Mm. And so, um, the one thing that we know categorically is that feeding with carbohydrate 
or protein for that matter, but protein less tolerable, but feeding with carbohydrate is protective to the gut. Mm. So keep those carbs coming through, where, particularly over the long duration and even more so in the heat, that is very protective to the gut. Um, and yeah, I think that that's an area um, in, in the ketogenic side of things, like it's great looking at, uh, you know, fuel kinetics and, you know, performance outcomes and all that. Um, but, you know, the broader health implications, that's, that's where I think more, more needs to be done in that area. I think the time is ripe for that because the initial investigations were all around fuel kinetics. I mean, going back to the old, you know, Finney studies, um, and it, it takes time to do the more nuanced, Hey, what are the tertiary and second stream and third stream types of effects of these diets? Like they, that you were just talking about, but it, that kind of thought process has always been interesting to me because we've always known some of the theoretical mechanistic underpinnings of why it might actually be true. And we started out the podcast talking about mechanistic stuff in a joking way. Maybe we'll kind of end it talking about mechanistic stuff in, in this way. I mean, you do have to come back to it because it does make sense, but then you have to investigate it to see if it's actually true or not, right? Correct, correct, absolutely. Yeah. That's fascinating yeah. that you guys are doing that. I can't wait for, so can I get you back on the podcast when that comes out? Uh, <laughs> or one of your colleagues? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, you should, yeah, you should get yeah, one of my colleagues on. Yeah, no, that would be Look, great. I'm, I, no, don't, sorry, don't, don't misinterpret. I'd, I'd love to come back on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's we'll just... have you on any time. Like I said at the beginning, man, y'all are crushing it at Monash University. Something in the water there is like <laughs> pr putting out super volumes of studies that are all like really practical there. Um, I appreciate your time and I appreciate what you uh, kind of what you contribute to the space because it helps people like me vastly understand not only what's going on and the weird things in our lab every so often that we see that we were joking about, but also ultimately how, how to help athletes perform better. And, and so for me to you, it's, it's very important what you guys do. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I will, uh, I'll put a link to the paper that we referenced in the show notes, but is there any other way that you want to mention to the listeners of how they can get a hold of you or learn more about the lab or the research that you guys are doing? Uh, yeah, I probably should have thought about this beforehand, shouldn't I? Uh, <laughs> at this stage, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've heard your guests before and they say, oh, you know, you can catch me on Insta or Twitter or whatever. I'm terrible on socials currently. I mean, that hopefully that will change in the future. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm happy to, to yeah, if, if people email me, I will, uh, yeah, I will give an answer. Um, and, yeah, with regard to, um, to Monash, yeah, you can follow our... Um, our Facebook page. So yeah, maybe Jason afterwards, we could yeah put on a link. Yep. I'll have uh, links to everything right. in the show notes. You're the second guest this week that has offered up their email address in the show notes. And I don't know if I want to do that or not. I don't know if I want right. to subject you to that because you'll be surprised at some of the people that reach oh, really? out to you afterwards. But you, hey, if you're up to it, more power to you, man. We'll get you out there in the space. <laughs> Con contact Jason, please, and he'll he'll oh, forward my detail. How's, how's no, that? <laughs> yeah, no way. I'm not, you can filter I, through it. <laughs> I'm not filtering that, man. You start talking about diets. I don't want to. I don't want to step into it with ten foot pole. <laughs> oh, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. this. is super fun. We're, we're definitely going to have you back on when uh, when this next bit of research comes out. All right. Thank you very much, Jason. All right, folks. There you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Chris for coming on the podcast today. And I feel that like every month. I'm gonna have somebody from Monash come on the podcast because they have absolutely been crushing it. The research is all very high quality. And like I said, during the intro, it just happens to have a little bit of an ultra marathon slant, which I am very, very, very grateful for. I appreciate the heck out of each and every one of you listeners so much so that I have just realized that very soon, maybe on this podcast actually, the Coopcast is going to reach 1 million downloads. And when I very first started this podcast, I didn't have any notion that it was gonna actually get this popular. And I'm incredibly grateful to the listeners out there and to support and the support that I've received from the community for this particular platform. I talk about things that are not the sexiest. They are not definitely not the most popular. I don't bring on the most popular athletes week in and week out and try to specifically target number of downloads or number of listeners. 
I just want to bring actionable information to the forefront and information that I will use in my coaching practice to the masses. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to do something special for the 1 millionth download. I don't know what it's going to be yet. If you have an idea, send me a DM via Twitter or via Instagram. I'd love to take in those ideas, but needless to say, I am incredibly appreciative, grateful, and humbled at all of the support. If you want to support this podcast further, give it a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts that helps it reach a much broader audience. As you guys know, there are no sponsors or endorsements on this podcast. And that quite frankly does limit the audience a little bit because I don't have partners pushing out my stuff, which is totally fine uh, for me. But you can help out by sharing it with your friends or giving it a rating or a review. I'm very grateful for those. That is it for today, folks. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.